The last speaker of this session is going to be Doug Laufenberger. Uh, Doug, as I suspect many of you know, is the Ford Professor of Bioengineering and the Chairman of the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT. He also holds appointments in the Departments of Biology and the Departments of Chemical Engineering. Uh, Doug's major research interest, I think, since founding his lab has really been the fusion of engineering with molecular cell biology. And in particular, it's been the application of engineering approaches to delve deeper into a fundamental understanding of biological processes. The title of his talk today is Multiscale In Vivo Systems Analysis of Cell Signaling in Inflammatory Pathologies. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks for having me here. Titles uh, change, the content uh, remains the same. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a study with a terrific partnership with uh, Kevin Haggis, who's here in the audience. Uh, Kevin and I will tell the same story different ways, so if the way I explain it doesn't make sense, uh, you can grab, uh, grab Kevin at the break. This is also done by a, uh, pro predominantly by a terrific postdoc, Ken Lau, who's on his way to a position at Vanderbilt, and I believe Ken is here as well. So uh, this is a, what, I, what I really view as a, a paradigmatic study. The, the biological uh, problem itself here is a very basic one, but I think uh, this will uh, help us figure out how to apply this uh, to other types of problems. And uh, systems biology people are very uh, familiar with from different angles. One thing that uh, Kevin and I have tried to do together is really to bring this out of cell culture, out of in vitro cell populations into in vivo context with microenvironment and multiple cell, uh, cell populations uh, and so forth. Uh, I will also claim, given my engineering background, this is systems biology is really nothing more than bioengineering analysis of complex systems. For some people, uh, this is a surprising place for bioengineers to be because they think bioengineers wait to be told what to make and, and, and figure out how to deliver it. We think given the complexity of, of biology, we also have a, uh, a vital role in figuring out what to make and, and deliver uh, as well. So I, I think this uh, is, is in, in that vein. So here's the general problem, and then I'll tell you about the specific one in a minute. The general problem is in any kind of a, a tissue pathology, can we uh, learn how to intervene in a predictive manner? You have multiple cell types, you have multiple cytokines, growth factors, matrix uh, inside each cell or multiple pathways. You can think of ways you might intervene with small molecules or antibodies or cytokines or cell depletions or cell additions. Can we actually uh, figure out how to do this in a predictive manner, uh, taking into account many, many of the moving parts at once? Uh, and, and that's the idea uh, that we're after here. Now, this is an integrative problem. What this means is, at any level, certainly one needs to understand multiple molecular components all at once, whether they're signaling pathways or whether they're cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, matrix. Uh, one needs to know more about them than sequence or expression levels. They actually have uh, 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 properties of their biochemistry. And of course, if one was talking about uh, tissue, organ, pathophysiology, one has to integrate from uh, individual cell types and culture into the actual milieu of a living animal or a patient. And so that's what Kevin and I uh, have really been uh, aspiring to. So here's the example problem for today. Very basic, but I'll tell you at the end that, that Kevin and I now are encouraged enough by this to be moving on to uh, some, some other problems. And it's simply this, that if you have uh, in, uh, in an intestine, and this is going to be mouse model studies, if you treat them acutely with tumor necrosis factor, which can induce inflammation, what happens? What actually happens that lead to a, a damage response in the intestinal epithelium? Apoptotic death in this particular case. Uh, uh, hyperproliferation, we've also studied. That's another facet of that. I won't dwell on that today. Uh, it's an interesting basic problem. TNF is a central media of in inflammation. The intestine is very important in the uh, immune response. Uh, and even though this is a well-studied problem, looking at it all together, again, with all these moving parts, uh, it, it isn't as well understood as, as uh, people would imagine. So here's the thought process. And with a number of collaborators, Michael Yaffe and Forrest White and, and Peter Sorger and Joan Brugge, We've done this many, many problems in cell culture, where we said, let's just take cells and 
see what it is it about their multiple moving parts of their signaling pathways, regulatory pathways, that will govern phenotypes like proliferation, uh, death, migration, differentiation. Uh, and the way we think about this is the way an engineer thinks about a complex system, and that is there's some endpoints, the phenotype you're interested in, many potential pathways regulating that. You have to distribute your measurements across those. But even more importantly, uh, one has to probe this system by treating it under many different conditions. One can't just select one condition that one thinks is most physiological and then make many measurements on it. You will never ascertain the operation of the system that way. So a key is to push and prod your system in cell culture, different uh, cytokines, growth factors, different combinations of them. And from the combination of how the regulatory network activities move along with the phenotypic responses under all these different conditions, then by computational analysis, you can pull out hypotheses about the key relationships. So we've done this on many problems in vitro uh, to great encouragement. And the idea is, can we now actually take this into in vivo? Clinical patients, uh, which we're starting to do, uh, and mouse models, uh, which we, uh, well, I'll show you here. So this is the specific study. Uh, the, the first study undertaken by, uh, by Ken Lau. Uh, and it's as simple as this. Uh, a variety of mice treated with either control, low-dose TNF, a higher-dose TNF. In this study, a wild-type LAC6, RAG1 knockouts, uh, moving on to RAS mutants. I'll show you a little bit of that at the end. And then following the treatment, one can look, depending on what the treatment is and what the phenotype one's looking for, a few hours of response, can be days, can be weeks, and then taking the tissue samples, and one can look at, at actually different tissue regions. That matters because you get different microenvironments, you get different cell populations. The response to any type of perturbation is going to be different, and we've uh, demonstrated that. And then from those samples, measure the types of things that we want to measure. So intracellular phosphoprotein signals, extracellular cytokines, chemokines, immune inflammatory cell types, then perturbing the systems with things that come out of the computational models for hypotheses for what the key actors are when all these moving parts are operating in concert. So these are the types of measurements uh, we're able to make. So in response to TNF treatments here, this is just taking tissue samples out of the ileum in red and the duodenum in blue with two different doses, low and high dose, uh, measurements of proliferation, measurements of apoptotic death. And what you can see, for instance, is in response to TNF, there's really no apoptotic death in the ileum. In the duodenum, there is, and it's dose responsive. Uh, proliferation, on the other hand, is actually activated in the ileum and is suppressed in the, in the uh, duodenum. And so can one explain uh, why these different uh, uh, phenotypes are happening in response to this uh, particular treatment? So what does one need to measure to uh, try to get some uh, explanatory power and some predictive ways to intervene in the system? Well, one is what's going on in the intestinal epithelial cells. There's multiple pathways downstream of TNF that you add and all the other growth factors and cytokines that are in the environment. Unlike cell culture, we don't have to add a lot of different other things because the tissue is doing it for you. So we're getting all these multiple uh, conditions just by having multiple mice. So downstream of all the inputs, TNF, and everything else in the tissues, there's key pathways, and we can measure uh, by luminex assays, dynamic responses of phospho signals in these pathways uh, across, uh, oh, about a dozen or so. And you see that they're different in the ileum and the duodenum. They're dose-dependent, and a lot of things are changing. We also measure what's going on in the extracellular milieu from the tissue. Also, luminex bioplex assay, uh, can measure up to 50 cytokines and chemokines simultaneously. So here's a set of about 23 of them. Again, red in the ileum, blue in the duodenum, uh, dose response, and some of them change a lot, some of them change a little bit, but many things are changing. Also, by flow cytometry, measure different cell types that are there. Okay. Uh, neutrophils, uh, B cells, different types of uh, T cells, and K cells, different types of dendritic cells, different types of macrophages, and they change under the different conditions 
uh, especially genetically. Uh, you knock out the uh, lymphocytes and the immune cell populations change, thereby setting up different cytokine chemokine milieu, thereby setting up different signals, thereby setting up different phenotypic responses. Now, to make sense out of all of this, uh, we need, at least Kevin and I, need uh, computational analysis to, to sort through it. Uh, there's a variety of uh, types of methods we can bring to bear. The, I'm going to talk mainly about the very simplest thing, simple uh, relational models. I, uh, if I have time, I'll tell you at the end how we're pushing this to uh, uh, logic models as well that tell you even more uh, aiming toward uh, mechanism of what's going on. So from the, uh, from the relational models, this is a lot like the principal components uh, analysis that Rudolph just showed. Uh, what's shown here, this is called the discriminant partial least squares uh, because the phenotypes are categorical. You might have no apoptosis in the ileum. You might have late apoptosis at the low doses of TNF in the duodenum. You might have early apoptosis at high doses of TNF in the duodenum. And what you get in this particular case out of the phospho signals in the intestinal epithelium, there's two principal components, two eigenvectors, two latent variables, whatever you want to call them. And one has to do with uh, whether you actually get proliferation or apoptosis. Another has to do with the dynamics, the timing of it. And from projecting the signals under all the different treatment conditions that fall under the different phenotypes or not, you can find associations between the dynamic signals that are, in fact, related to the delayed apoptosis, are related to suppression of apoptosis and, in fact, uh, proliferation, or are uh, related to a faster onset of apoptosis. And you can go back into the signals and, and see where they come from. Now, that's pure correlation, what you'd like to do is to be able to make some prediction to say, if I had a small molecule inhibitor, the kind of things Jeff Settlman talked about, and if I put it into the system, what would happen? Is it obvious? Okay, and sometimes one thinks it's obvious and, and, and uh, often it's not. So what's done here is a very simple thing with a, uh, a MEK inhibitor, a very nice and clean uh, MEK inhibitor. Uh, for those who know, PD325901. And so you now treat the mice with the low dose of TNF, in which there should just be a late apoptosis, treat it with the MEK inhibitor, and what the model predicts when you measure the signals is you should move up into the region of faster apoptosis. And in terms of the classification, then you move from the low, the low stimulation, late apoptosis, to early apoptosis, just as if you had the high dose. That's exactly what happens. The blue line is the low dose of TNF. And the uh, shift, you add the, the, you add the MEK inhibitor to the low dose of TNF, and it actually shifts as if you had a higher dose of TNF, faster apoptosis. Now, if you think about it, this should be surprising, because if you added an inhibitor to a signal induced by TNF, and the result that's predicted and found is as if you had a higher concentration of the stimulus for that signal. Okay? As a univariate predictor, that is a contradiction. Okay, if you take the time to think it through. So the answer is it's not a univariate predictor. What happened to the MEK pathway is insufficient to explain the apoptotic response. So in fact, what you see is along with the inhibition of the MEK and ERK pathway, you see many other pathways are changed. Uh, RISC, AKT, um, others I can't even uh, remember what this one is. Uh, that's junk. Okay. And in response to adding the inhibitor, all of these signals are changed. Now, this is important. This is not off-target bad chemistry. This is merely crosstalk. These pathways do not operate parallel isolation. You think you're just inhibiting MEK. These other pathways are changing due to crosstalk, not bad chemistry. Okay. But nonetheless, if you take into account, the model takes into account the changes in all these pathways because the cell depends on all of them to determine if it's going to proliferate or die you get the proper prediction. You can make a test and say, if all that's happening is I'm blocking the MEK and ERK pathway and nothing else has changed, you can put that in the model and say, I'm just changing the MEK ERK pathway, which is the way my straightforward univariate chemistry says, the prediction is I should have no effect on the apoptosis. So the effect of the drug, the reason the drug affects apoptosis is because it's not only affecting the MEK ERK pathway, but it's affecting many other pathways at the same time. 
If you don't comprehend that, you can't properly understand the effects of these kinds of drugs and these kind of networks. Okay, let's go beyond that. Now let's incorporate the uh, RAG1 knockout data. Uh, lymphocytes are gone. What happens? So if you look at normalized death, and this is just in the duodenum, now we're just gonna stay in the duodenum. Normalized death, you deplete the lymphocytes and you get faster apoptosis. But if you now unnormalize it and you actually get a, a, a absolute magnitude, you get dramatically enhanced apoptosis as well. These, these uh, mice deplete the lymphocytes, now in response to TNF, their intestines really get, get blown apart by apoptosis, so dramatically enhanced response. So what's happening? A lot of things are happening. If you look in the intestinal epithelium, all these signals, many of them are being altered because the lymphocytes aren't there, the, mic the microenvironment changes. If you look at the cytokines and chemokines, they are changed. So uh, if you look at the difference now between the red and the blue, with the red being the RAG1 knockouts, the blue being the wild types, you see that many of the cytokines and chemokines are changed, so are many of the intracellular intestinal epithelial signals. How do we make sense out of this? What really matters? Well, we go back to the same kind of relational models, and under all these conditions, wild type, low, high dose TNF, RAG1 knockouts, low dose TNF, across the different uh, signaling pathways that we've measured, different times, a heat map, what the modeling tells you is there's a key eigenvector that's associated with the aggravated fast and high apoptosis now in the, in the RAG1 knockout mice, and the cell is summing up four key pathways. These bars represent the weighting coefficients on these signal measurements that add up on the eigenvector that tell you how aggravated is your apoptosis. So something's happening by depleting these lymphocytes that's aggravating these four pathways that are enhancing the apoptosis in, in terms of uh, uh, absolute magnitude. So remember this plot. There's four pathways that, according to this model, the cells are adding up. And remember, we validated this model by the MEK inhibitor that I already showed you. Now, if you do the same thing on the cytokines and chemokines, you can get an analogous type of relationship. So instead of all these columns being the phospho signals, these are now the cytokines and chemokines in the environment under all the same conditions. You get the same kind of eigenvectors that are related to high apoptosis, low apoptosis, uh, late and uh, low in the duodenum at the low dose. Uh, these are the RAG1 knockouts, the fast and high apoptosis. And so what one asks is, are there relationships between any of these cytokines and chemokines that are associated with certain of these phenotypes, and many seem to be. Interesting, the levels of MCP1, or CCL2, early on are almost singularly associated with the suppression of apoptosis. Even though you've pulled out the lymphocytes, even though, uh, or you haven't pulled out the lymphocytes in this particular case, but when they're there, uh, this cytokine uh, this chemokine is associated with that. So this is a correlative prediction that this uh, chemokine is protective against TNF-induced epithelial cell apoptosis. Okay? You can test this, of course. You can neutralize this, uh, this chemokine with an antibody. If you do that and put it back into the model, the model says it should shift and get you the same kind of aggravated apoptosis as if you had the RAG1 knockouts. So wild-type mice. It says, pull out, these, pull out this, uh, this chemokine, and you should get the aggravated apoptosis as if they weren't wild type, but were RAG1 knockouts. And that's exactly what happens. You shift it to sooner and to faster. So out of this comes these molecular hypotheses that one can test. They might be right, they might be wrong, uh, and sometimes they're right. Now, what about where did these come from? Uh, what's going on with the cell types? So now you can go to the cell type data and say, under these different conditions, wild type, RAG1 knockouts, now we have data of the wild type and the neutralized MCP1, and what's happened there, and measure these different cell types and look for associations between changes in the different cell types and changes in the outcome. And one that's most striking are the plasmacytoid dendritic cells that are strongly increased in both the RAG1 knockout mice and in the MCP1 depleted mice, the same conditions under which one gets the aggravated apoptosis. Also, uh, the NK cells, for instance, are increased with RAG1 knockouts, although not so much with the, uh, with the MCP1 depleted. 
Well, so that leads to a hypothesis. Now you can deplete the mice and redo the experiments, depleting any one of these cell types you want. Deplete the, the plasmacytoid dendritic cells uh, with the RAG1 mice, and now it's as if they're wild type. They now are protected against the apoptosis. Deplete the NK cells, and that doesn't happen. Okay, so one, one can test this change, and in fact, uh, this seems to be the case. Now you ask, okay, what is it about the presence of the plasmacytoid dendritic cells that somehow seem to sensitize the epithelial cells to TNF treatment? Now these sentences may seem to have many phrases in them, but that's correct. These are the moving parts. A lot of things are changing. Lymphocytes, MCP1, dendritic cells, TNF, signals, okay? This study comprehends those things concomitantly, and that's the whole point. So now you say, what are the consequences of what the PDCs are doing? So now you take the cytokine chemokine data under the conditions as before and under your new conditions that we've depleted MCP1. Now uh, put those back into the model and see what's related to the suppression of apoptosis or the enhancement of it. And this may be less of a surprise, but interferon gamma is strongly indicated as a sensitizing agent associated with the presence of the plasmacytoid dendritic cells. So now one looks at the effects of apoptosis. Uh, not surprisingly then, you take wild type mice in which there's not much apoptosis response to low dose TNF, add interferon gamma, and it does sensitize. This happens in vitro too, it, it happens in vivo. Now if you take the RAG1 knockouts, and then we know what's happened here is there's less MCP1, there's fewer uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells. Now you deplete anti-interferon gamma in that case, and now you've, di now you've diminished apoptosis uh, like the model says it should. So I can't go into all the details of the study. Ken and Kevin did some very detailed uh, analysis to look in situ and who's making what and so forth, but I'll just encapsulate it here that the thread goes the epithelial cell apoptotic death in response to TNF is aggravated by interferon gamma production enhancement by the plasmacytoid dendritic cells whose level in the microenvironment is influenced by resident T lymphocyte elicited MCP1 secretion by goblet cells in the intestine. Okay. That's the chain of events that's come out of this concomitant data set of measurements of molecular and cellular components at different levels. Uh, the computational analysis and pulling it out. So this is the, this is the way the story looks. Uh, under normal conditions, goblet cells are making this. It's preventing the PDCs from coming in. That's reducing the amount of interferon gamma, and there's a low level of this. Now in the absence of the, uh, absence of the T cells, uh, the, they're making, the goblet cells are making less MCP1. There's more PDCs coming in. There's enhancement of TNF, uh, of interferon gamma, and that enhances the response to TNF. I said, these things have been, have been tested. Now, here's the most important part. This is where I said, remember back to that four, that's that, the model that said there's an eigenvector with four signaling pathways in it, and the cell is adding up those four signaling pathways to tell you what's going on. So what's plotted here is that eigenvector. So if all you do is measure the activities of, the, of those four signaling pathways, under all these different conditions, it should tell you whether you're going to be in a strong degree of apoptosis, we'll call that disease, or a low level of apoptosis, we'll call that normal. And that's really exactly what happens. So wild type cells, the projection is the negative along this uh, uh, eigenvector, that's normal background. You deplete MCP1, measure the signals in the epithelial cells, and they've now shifted to the positive side of the eigenvector, where there should be uh, the apoptosis and disease. The RAG1 knockouts measure the signals in the epithelial cells there. They project very strongly here, take those same mice, deplete of the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, and the eigenvector shifts back the other way. Take the wild type mice, add interferon gamma, those four signals shift back up to the positive side. So this eigenvector inside the intestinal epithelial cells is accounting for all these microenvironmental changes, cell types, cytokines, chemokines, in the end, they're all impinging on the epithelial cells, and this is how they add up what's going on in their environment. So this is just a statement of it. The microenvironmental, molecular, and cellular in influences, all the moving parts, yield a multi-pathway epithelial cell signaling network balance that governs the apoptosis outcomes across all your various treatments and so forth. 
Okay, so we're encouraged by this. Uh, what are we moving on to? A more chronic intestinal inflammation model, adoptive T cell transfer. Uh, Jesse Lyons, a postdoc who's here uh, with Kevin. Uh, an Alzheimer's disease model with Kevin and, and, and Brad Hyman. And then, in fact, in human patients, where we can get the samples uh, endometriosis with Linda Griffith and Keith Isaacson and Newton Wellesley and HIV AIDS in human patients, Daryl Irvin, Chris Love, and, and Bruce Walker uh, at MGH and the Reagan Institute. Because when we can get samples like this, that we can make these measurements, we can put together the same kind of analysis and pull out the same kind of hypotheses for what's going to happen when you intervene. Uh, let me end by just giving you a flavor to say from these data you can actually push the system farther in terms of how you understand it. So that same data, and this is a little bit like Rudolph showed with the Bayesian networks. He showed both relational modeling and then the network modeling. Uh, one can do the same thing here. We've chosen to use something called fuzzy logic instead of Bayesian networks. They have their pluses and minuses. So from the data, the signaling and the cytokines and chemokines, mapping them onto these kind of interact action maps, then quantifying all the potential interactions upstream and downstream in terms of logic gates, a transfer function from depending on if what's upstream is on or off, high or low, then what's downstream is on or off, high or low. Uh, now in this particular case, this is a new study that we're just uh, pulling together. What's happening in KRAS versus NRAS mutations in these mice? Well, in response to TNF, their intestinal epithelial apoptotic, uh, apoptotic death is different. Their signaling across multiple pathways is different. What's actually happening in that network and by putting these into a logic model, we can see that there's actually different dynamics going on downstream in response to TNF and the other things in the microenvironment. Depending on if you have KRAS mutations or NRAS mutations, you're actually getting different pathways highlighted more strongly or more weakly, which will allow us to predict then if one comes in with a small molecule inhibitor, why it should work or shouldn't work with a KRAS mutant and not an NRAS mutant. This kind of model will be capable of that. All right, let me uh, end here, especially thank Kevin and Ken Lau and Sarah Schreier uh, is starting on the logic modeling I showed you at the end. Thanks very much. Questions for Doug? Okay, you can ask Kevin, because if, if that doesn't make sense. Have you tried looking, I'll ask one question, have you tried looking in the tissue sections to see where the sort, which exact cells are the ones that are responsible for the different signals that you're seeing? Yeah, there's, um, I didn't show that, but uh, there was a lot of uh, IHC done to actually look that. Uh, for instance, in this particular case, we could verify that these phospho signals were taking place in the intestinal epithelial cells and not in various lymphocytes or things like that. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Doug, I think you said this, but uh, just to amplify on a little bit, it surprises me that the Ragnall mice and the MCP1 inhibited mice um, would produce many of the same signaling outputs as you measure them in the tail. So when you look globally, how similar are those? I understand that there's a common X, you know, uh, definitive change that, that is sort of responsible for the output, but otherwise, how similar are yep. they? Yep. Uh, there are other differences, and two things, two things happen. One is all of these things are regressed by the relational model against this particular phenotype, which is just intestinal epithelial cell apoptosis. One could imagine other phenotypic characterizations, okay? And on those other characterizations, the MCP1 may be utterly irrelevant. And other things that then are different between RAG1 and, and the depletion of that would strongly affect that other phenotype. Okay, so, so that's a, another big lesson out of this is to characterize your phenotype, uh, you've got to do probably more than, than something this narrow. The second, the second answer is uh, when I showed you one of those relational diagrams and where uh, interferon gamma was, for instance, there were other cytokines and chemokines there that also then might be moving in concert, sort of co-correlated. Uh, so some of those then may in fact be shared between the RAG knockouts and the uh, MCP1 depleted, but again, not related to this particular phenotype. So some things are co-correlated and other things aren't, and all we did here was filter through just this one phenotypic measurement.